Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the CPA podcast, a place where we chat about our own recent achievements in the area of electronics, software, and mechanical engineering, and more likely than not, give excuses for not having done anything at all. Hello, and welcome back to another episode. Uh, sorry for the long delay, it's been about one month, so um, for now there was some stuff that failed, some events I went to, and some stuff I did that actually worked, so we'll talk a bit about that. Let's start with the failures. First of all, I made a PCB for work. The failure there was that a connector, that was a programming connector to a microcontroller, the header didn't fit there, there was another component sitting uh, close by, so there was no more space. Uh, That was not all. I also swapped a transistor footprint, so the base and emitter were swapped. What I did was a SOT23 size component, so what I did was just flip them upside down and solder them, so to check if the board worked. And uh, I changed that in a new revision. However, I forgot to fix the connector, so uh, yeah. So, something that is interesting is a very strange problem with the scope I was seeing here. I was measuring a drain voltage of a FAT, uh, end channel FAT, and the drain voltage was basically sitting between 24 volts when the FAT was not conducting and 0 volts or near 0 volts when the FAT was conducting. Now, I was zooming in on the part near ground, so that was a relatively big signal, large signal, and I was using about 100 millivolts per division or 50 millivolts per division, and positioning the signal in the vertical direction so that, let's say, 99% of the signal was off screen, and zoomed in on a bit near ground, because I'm interested in that. And what I noticed was that the signal shape is very distorted, it's very... It was not what I expected at all. It was like the scope was lying to me. So I was starting to get a little bit uh, puzzled and um, started to look if I could reproduce the problem with a function generator. I could indeed, and a block wave between 0 and 24 volts and the same scope settings, I could reproduce the problem quite fine. So I thought it was a problem within the scope. Try different channels, each channel showed the same symptom. So I started looking for uh, bugs online with this scope. I'm using the Riggle DS154Z or Z scope, which is a very nice thing. Couldn't find anything. So I took the, uh, asked a friend of mine if he knew what the problem was. It, we went through all the symptoms and eventually I told him, yeah, that 99% of the signals is off screen. He was a bit uh, disappointed because that was a common problem. He should not have your signals clipped by the scope. Apparently what happens is between the probe input of the scope and the digital part there's an ADC and closer to the probe input there's an amplifier or attenuator circuit. Now I guess the amplifier or attenuation attenuation circuit has a op amp or op amps which can go into saturation and if an op amp goes into saturation that means if the output voltage is uh, against a positive op amp rail or a negative op amp rail it takes a little time for the output voltage to return back to, let's say, in the middle of the positive and the negative rail of the op amp. So in uh, scope terms, I think it's called overdrive recovery time, and some scopes have a short overdrive recovery time, so the display signal returns to normal quickly after the saturation condition is gone, but this scope is pretty horrible in that, uh, in that regard. So, uh, yeah, uh, lesson learned, never clip your signals, always make sure that the whole signal fits uh, on your display. And the problem was uh, I needed to zoom in on a very small portion of the signal near ground and ignore everything above, let's say, uh, half a volt. So what I did was use a zener or a diode, I can't remember, to ignore everything uh, or to, cl- to clip the signal to 0.7 volts or 1 volt or whatever the Zener uh, voltage was. So that worked fine and everything was as expected. So I must have done this wrong a lot of times because this was not something I expected. Somehow I expected the scope to be a magic box and uh, and warning me for these conditions but apparently it does not. It must, must be a, a gotcha for people who use a scope. Maybe you knew it, maybe not, but I didn't and uh, I feel a bit silly now. 
And talking of silly things, I got a headphone with a built-in mp3 player and SD card reader. And I wanted a headphone without any wires, so with a battery and everything integrated into the headphone itself. That's easy uh, when you go sport, for example, you don't have any wires. So, bought the thing and it also came with a Bluetooth uh, connectivity to the phone, which I don't want, to be honest. I'm also so security conscious, but I don't want people trolling me by connecting my headphone to their phone and then playing me crap music or something like that, what I don't expect, so I didn't want that. So, what I tried to do was disable the Bluetooth uh, feature. Now, if you open it up, there was a PCB antenna in it, and I think it's called inverted F antenna, so PCB shape, trace shape. And the two inductors in the antenna path. So I thought, hey, let's remove these and the Bluetooth functionality is gone. However, it will still connect to your phone. The next thing I tried was to ground the antenna halfway, uh, physically connect the antenna trace to the ground plane with a solder bridge or blob of solder or something like that. Uh, still would connect from a few meters away. So the next uh, attempt was remove the complete antenna trace and uh, simply tear it off the PCB, so the only the lead of the chip inside the headphone was still present. It was one of these uh, multimedia all-in-one system on chip things, uh, player and battery uh, charger and everything built into one chip. So it was still connect from a few meters away. So next thing I tried was solder the lead, it was a QFN32 chip, solder the, the chip right at the lead to the ground plane and it would still connect to the phone from one meter away or something like that so then I gave up uh, guessing nobody within one meter radius will uh, start trolling me so, but uh, I found it very weird so the Bluetooth receiver at least or receiver and transmitter is very uh, very robust I didn't expect that there were some events in the country I went to. First of all, it was the GLOW event. GLOW is a light-based festival. It's once a year near the winter, near November, I think, or always in November, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And uh, it basically consists of a, a number of mostly outdoor events. Some are indoors, and you can go take a tour, walk a tour through the city center or uh, thereabouts to visit each uh, installation and then... Yeah, it takes three or four hours or something like that, and then you're done. You saw everything. Some stuff is interactive, most of the stuff is not. And uh, I like it. It's nice, but to be honest, I think I liked it more ten years ago when it was a bit smaller. Now there's just too many people, and it takes a long time to f see everything, and there's no time or no opportunity to see everything because it's completely packed with people, even on a weekday. I'm not complaining, but I will use to like it more. Also, a few years ago, there was a special section for small individual projects. Now they have project where companies sponsor the projects and you have like thousands and thousands of euros spent on a project and it's big and, and all, all the people like it but I, to be honest I like the small individual creative surprising projects much more and back then a few years ago they had a special uh, section of only those small projects so for example one meter big something uh, that hang on a wall that hangs on the wall and or an interactive painting or one room with a light effect or interactive light effect or something like that i like that much more so it's still nice and uh, please take a look go take a look next year if you didn't do that but uh, i think i'll maybe i'll pass <laughs> i also talked a few times ago about the uh, awesome space repair day awesome space is a retro computer place in the center of the netherlands in utrecht now uh, they have a repair day once every month and this month was no exception so we went there and uh, had a very good time and i even fixed three tvs the problem was a loose connection on all three tvs probably this was a common problem in that model of tv and I was there together with another, some other guys. We fixed other TVs and also take a look at the, took a look at the printer, plotter, cutter, something like that, which didn't work. But uh, it was a lot of fun anyway. Now I guess the fixing of stuff has a lot to do with attitude because my default attitude when I see stuff that doesn't work is oh it's too difficult and uh, it's a magic box and uh, I don't know how it works, unless it's something that I really understand and I'll try to fix it, but usually I don't even bother if I don't understand it completely and that's not really the way to go I guess. There's another guy who's much more positive than me in that respect, so he just starts fixing stuff even if he doesn't understand and he doesn't know what to expect, so I learned a lot from that because I wouldn't have touched those TVs and wouldn't have fixed those TVs if, uh, if he didn't give me a little push in the right direction. 
So that was nice. One more social thing, if you haven't fallen asleep by this time, is the HCC Retro Division meeting. I think they have four meetings a year, and uh, this time I was there as well. I think this was the third or the fourth time I've been there, and I gave a little talk about my CPU project, and uh, that went very nice. I prepared some slides, and some I think 100 slides or approximately, and I did a talk to our 15 people, I think, or thereabouts, and it went very well. I think I talked on this podcast about me getting into breathing problems when I talk in front of a crowd. I was completely gone now, so... Uh, I'm quite happy about it. I didn't know. I don't know what fixed it, but uh, that was uh, that went very okay. And I'll do it again. That's nice. Nice crowd. Nice people. Nice everything. I guess everyone there has his or her own manual, uh, like myself. But um, I like it there, so I'll go there again. As far as my own hobby projects are concerned, there's not only failure. There's also uh, success. Uh, last time I talked already about a prototype for a VGA signal generation. I took a small microcontroller board and connected that to a VGA connector and connected that to a monitor and then was able to produce a green screen, basically half a green screen, and that was that was good enough. So uh, I thought that was it, get it out of my system and do other stuff. However, the VGA stuff proved to be more interesting than I thought, so I continued a little bit and also made a small PCB to generate a VGA signal using a microcontroller. There's a small PCB with four uh, VGA connectors on it, so you can control four monitors using one microcontroller. And on one side there's a USB connection to the PC, so theoretically you could feed it a data stream with RGB values for each monitor. And uh, there's also an SD card slot where you could use an SD card with a data stream, a color stream on it, which is then read and fed to the monitors at 60 Hz. Now, I'm fairly lazy. That's basically what this whole podcast is about, being lazy and uh, minimal effort, maximum gain. So in this case, uh, there was no exception. There are some projects that try to, or try or succeed in generating an actual image for a VGA monitor or composite monitor, a PAL or NTSC monitor. Uh, I didn't try that. So uh, the problem there is you have to, you have to output pixels at the exact right time and then you have to keep a frame buffer and it's quite uh, finicky with the timing I think. So instead I chose to have one big screen with one color, one RGB color. So you basically treat the whole monitor as one RGB pixel which you can update at 60 Hz. I use uh, 640 by 480 resolution and the sync and the color information is generated from a microcontroller. microcontroller sorry. Now, just for proof of concept test, I did try some to generate some pixel data, or at least a data stream of 20 megahertz on a 20 megahertz uh, microcontroller. Microcontroller I use here are only AVR, so I use AVR for everything. That's Atmel AVR, used to be Atmel, it's now a microchip. And uh, it has SBI and UR devices on board, which can typically output at maximum the clock frequency divided by 2. So a 20 megahertz microcontroller can output at most 10 megahertz SPI or UR stream. However, if you take two of these uh, built-in peripheral devices, two UARTs, they are one clock cycle out of phase. So if you do the timing correctly, you can uh, schedule a byte to be transmitted using UART0, let's say that, and then meanwhile schedule a byte to be transmitted using UART1, and then uh, write a byte to UART0, then UART1, UART0, UART1. And I think that takes 8 instruction cycles in total to write bytes to 2 UART, so theoretically you can keep 2 UARTs busy. Now if there's one cycle uh, phase difference between you 2 UARTs, you could create a data streams out of those 2 UARTs so that if you put a XOR gate, uh, you put the 2 UART outputs into an XOR gate, the XOR output can be whatever you want at 20 megahertz. I, that should work. I looked at it on the scope, it should work, and then I forgot about it. But uh, maybe that's interesting. The problem, of course, is where do you get your data? For example, if you want to display characters at 20 megahertz, you have to have some kind of a frame buffer or get your data somewhere. So I think if you do that, for example, on VGA, you would run out of time. <laughs> So that VGA device basically takes a data stream to display. So it's basically a dumb device just playing RGB data onto monitors. That's what it's doing. 
Now to compile an RGB color stream out of effects, I made a Ruby script. So you can basically program effects on a timeline, uh, effects of a duration and an offset on a timeline and a color fade or color fade scheme and uh, the monitor on which the display and so on. And you can make hundreds or thousands of effects that play in parallel and it's basically compiled and out comes a data stream which you can in this case include into your C file and program it into the microcontroller on the VGA board and that plays. That's just a proof of concept. Eventually it should go on the SD card but I didn't do that part yet so uh, but this works and gives me a nice excuse to play with Ruby as a programming language. <laughs> For prototyping this stuff and also for the Commodore 64 in another uh, podcast episode, uh, in other words, to get an idea of how a visual effect looks before you actually do the code to program it, I used in the past and used for this project as well the NetPBM family of graphic formats. NetPBM consists of a few formats. One is a monocolor bitmap format, one is a grayscale bitmap format, bitmap format. there's an RGB version and there's some other stuff which I didn't look at. And the nice thing about this is that you can, uh, everything is human readable, human writable ASCII. So you can generate pictures conforming to the NetPBM, to one of the NetPBM formats uh, from Bash, for example, from a script, or you can type them in by hand. You can use them, you can make them in your text editor, and the file layout actually looks like the picture. So, for example, there's a zero there where there's white in the picture, and there's a one where there's black in the picture. So it's very intuitive. And this is a format that, for example, a GIMP, bitmap manipulation tool, or whatever it is, and uh, image magic uh, tools can use. So it's a well-known, well enough known graphic format. So I like it very much. I use it for a couple of things now, and it's uh, very nice to quickly prototype an effect. And what you're doing there is basically using Bash or whatever programming uh, language you want to to compile or to generate a data stream which you can then, for example, make a movie out of, or make an animated GIF out of. I uh, did that a few times, it's very fast, very nice. I'll put links to the NetPBM stuff, and also links of the VGA board in the show notes, with a few videos. Yeah, and that's already basically it. The, what I want to do in the near future is visit the... HCC Robotics Division, that's another division of the HCC Dutch Computer Club, and they focus on robotics, obviously. I think that's pretty nice, because there's actually stuff you can touch and stuff you can see, and I, have, I think they have competitions where the robot has to uh, avoid obstacles or pick up obstacles or something like that, so I want to see what goes on, or what, what kind of group it is, and how big it is, and so on. One other robot-related group or club is the RobotMC.be in Belgium, and uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. I've never been there, but I heard it uh, from it through some other guy who recommended it, so uh, I think they also have competitions and you have to avoid obstacles and so on, so I, I might go there, it's a uh, one hour drive from here, although it's in Belgium, I live pretty close to Belgium, so that's uh, convenient in that respect. So that was all for now. For more information, links and previous episodes, visit podcast.cba.si. Stay tuned, thanks for listening and goodbye.